Good morning. Welcome to today's uh, lecture for measurement ILM 310-302-L, I think it is, L, vortex flow meters. So we'll have a look at the devices here. You'll be amazed at the objectives today, uh, very similar to many of the other devices we've looked at. So vortex meters, beautiful, wonderful things. Uh, looking at them right, right off the bat, you can see uh, see some of the characteristics of it. We've got this big, big obstruction in the middle of the stream here, uh, which should tell you that it's not going to be good for uh, some things and will be better for other things. Quick picture on kind of the cartoon version of how this thing works. Um, but we'll uh, look at this just like we looked at any of the other devices so far and the rest of the devices that we still have to look at with the similar objectives, describing principles and applications, components, advantages, limitations, installation requirements, and maintenance and calibration of vortex meters. So we'll talk about the principle of application or operation, sorry, first. Uh, I think I got a lot of words here on this one. I'll just pop them all up here with the diagram so you can watch as we go along. So the way a turbo, or sorry, a vortex meter works here is as the flow or the turbulence hits this object in the center of the piping called the bluff body, the flow, of course, has to make its way past. This flow will split and alternate from one side of this bluff body to the other side of the bluff body. And as it does, it creates these vortexes or vortices as they call them. And they call this activity uh, vortex shedding. Uh, and it alternates back and forth from side to side as the flow goes across the bluff body and creates these vortices in what is called a vortex street. The rate of these vortices uh, that these vortices are formed is called the frequency and it is proportional to the fluid velocity. So kind of uh, pretty simple in terms of science here, nothing uh, fancy or mechanical or super scientific. Um, we'll talk about who thought of this thing here first. So here you see how the vortices kind of form one after the other from side to side. And again, there's good video at the end of this that'll, uh, that'll show you exactly how this works. So there we have the bluff body in the center of the uh, instrument down here. And as the flow comes by it, it's making these vortices alternating side to side. And we measure them using some type of detector uh, generally in this area. And the bulk of this ILM talks about the different styles uh, of detectors that are used to count these, uh, these vortices. So the original guy uh, named Von Karman uh, stated the operation of a vortex meter in terms of the flag fluttering in the wind. And he discovered that the intervals between these vortices or the, the flag waving back and forth is constant. Uh, and it was a function of the diameter of the flagpole. So as the wind got faster, the vortices were forming faster as well. And the flag, as a consequence, also fluttered faster. All of this happened without changing its wavelength. And this is kind of the aha moment where the guy discovered how these vortices uh, were formed, sitting outside on a sunny, sunny day watching the, watching the flag flutter. The principle of operation is based on uh, certain flow conditions uh, that are rather specific in terms of uh, some of the other devices that we've, we've talked about before. Um, this device mentions something specifically called Stroll's number. Uh, and we'll just give you a little bit of background. It's not something that's super duper critical, um, but it has to do with the, the construction and the relationship uh, of that bluff body. Uh, and the piping uh, that it's mounted in. So Struall, this guy, uh, determined that as long as the Reynolds number of the flowing stream is greater than 20,000, so that's an important number, uh, the ratio between the width of the bluff body, so that obstruction, uh, and the interval of the vortex is forming is 0.17. And these are just facts. There's no math that you're going to really have to uh, do with this, but this is background information on, on the science behind the vortex meter. Uh, and this number ended up being called the Stroll number. So in building a flow meter based on uh, Von Karman's principle, the manufacturer will usually select an obstruction width uh, for that obstruction that is one quarter 
of the pi diameter. And there's a little formula that goes uh, along with that, one quarter pi d i squared, uh, just to tell you how they kind of design uh, these devices. What's most important for us to know is that the Reynolds number uh, has to be more than uh, at least 2,000. I think that actually changed. I think uh, that number might have been uh, 20,000, but is that a typo? I better just, I'm just going to check here real quick here. Throw the runners one with up. Um, so, um, the Reynolds number less than 2,000 does not produce vortices. Uh, so we want to have a higher Reynolds number for this to operate. So 2,000 is uh, the correct number for what we're looking for in terms of minimum uh, minimum Reynolds number here. This number is just related to the science uh, behind selecting the, the size of the bluff body. So getting into detecting vortices, uh, I said earlier there are many different detectors that will sense the side-to-side -side alternation and end up creating a, a wavelength or lambda here, uh, the, the distance between uh, the vortices here. This frequency is proportional to the velocity and it is linear. So this is a linear device. Uh, again, as most of the devices we've looked at so far, uh, saving for uh, differential pressure style flow meters. Uh, there's some math in the ILM that describes the, the function of this uh, in detail, but for our purposes, really all we need to know is that as these vortices uh, move from side to side, depending on the, the sensor that we have here, and this one in particular is a pressure sensor, uh, the signal on uh, from that sensor is going to be an alternating signal uh, that looks that looks like this and it really is going to be the same for any type of uh, detector that we look at. So we end up getting uh, frequency peaks so we can count uh, basically pulses is what we're ultimately counting here and the distance between every one of these peaks represents uh, a discrete volume between these vortices. So we calculate the k-factor uh, for a vortex meter, uh, similar to calculating the k-factor uh, for a turbine meter or any of these uh, meters that have a discrete volume per pulse uh, and have a tendency to wear out, requiring us to uh, sometimes modify this k-factor. So the k-factor, uh, again, same, similar to turbine meters, is going to be uh, given uh, from a factory test, usually with the tag hanging on the meter telling you what the k-factor is um, by construction. Well, we end up doing some calculations, of course, using the, using the k-factor and frequency uh, in order to calculate the volume flow. Uh, and in this case, that formula, uh, very familiar uh, from turbine meters here, frequency is equal to the pulses per unit times the volumetric quantity. So we'll have a couple of examples of that math again, which are uh, same as the previous math that we did in turbine meters. So calculating the k-factor here, uh, I'm just going to snap it all up on the screen uh, at once. Determine the flow rate through a vortex shedding meter in liters per minute and a frequency of 125 hertz or member cycles per second. And its k-factor is 48.737 pulses per U.S. gallon. So just like we had in the previous ILM, um, the big things to worry about here are converting cycles uh, per second, which hertz is, to cycles per minute, and also converting liters uh, per minute and U.S. gallons and being able to go back and forth. So the process, again, just to review, we're going to convert the hertz to U.S. gallons. So in this case, uh, 125 hertz divided by uh, 48.737 pulses per U.S. gallon tells us that we're getting 2.565 U.S. gallons per second. Then we're going to convert to U.S. gallons per minute by multiplying that number by 60 to tell us that we get 153.9 U.S. gallons per minute. And then finally, we're going to do the conversion from gallons to liters, which is multiplying the number of gallons by 3.785 to get us 582.51 liters. So just kind of quickly going through that because it is again a review of the same math we did last ILM. Uh, one more example. Okay, if a vortex shedding meter has a flow rate of 140 liters a minute and a frequency of 25 hertz, what would its K factor be? 
So we're trying to figure out how many pulses uh, <clears throat> or how many gallons per pulse. So first we're going to convert uh, liters to minutes into gallons per minute. So uh, again, you can do these in different orders if you want to. This is just kind of the way that I do it. So 140 liters divided by 3.78 liters per gallon gives us 37 US gallons uh, per minute. And then we're going to convert hertz to pulses per minute. So 25 cycles per second times 60 seconds is 1500. So that's how many pulses that we're getting for that many gallons. So we then divide our frequency 1500 by our uh, volumetric flow, which was 37 US gallons to give us 40.54 as our K factor. So uh, just flipping the numbers around and again, trying to make sure you don't mess up any of the uh, seconds to minutes and liters to gallons conversions. Okay, next up here, applications uh, for vortex meters here. These can be used to measure flows of gases and liquids with proper Reynolds numbers, again, greater than 2000. Steam is a very common example for a vortex meter. Uh, they can handle some dirt um, but that will cause wear uh, on the bluff body over time. Some of these devices will also have pressure and temperature sensors um, as well, probably most of them these, these days. Uh, and again, by adding pressure and temperature, we can go from a volumetric measuring device into a mass flow device because in order to get uh, mass flow, we need to have density. And in order to get density, we need pressure and temperature. So different ranges of accuracy for different process uh, uh, states, I guess. So liquids um, are rated here. Gas is slightly less accurate uh, and fairly repeatable in terms of, uh, of this statistic here. 0.15% is a pretty good number. Construction of a vortex meter, again, not super complicated. Uh, we have meter flow to or the body of the device. We have the shutter bar or bluff body, um, as it's sometimes called. We have sensor. And then, of course, we have the electronic component uh, that receives the signal from, from the sensor. We'll look at each of the individual components here really quickly, one slide each kind of thing. So uh, flow tube uh, can be flanged or wafer style, of course. Uh, there's probably different mounting styles and that even I, I don't know but these are probably the most common ones here uh, wafer using less flanges and bolts so overall as an inst installation practice it is uh, a little bit cheaper um, but that's that is just what it is shutter bar close-up view here finally uh, again the short uh, the shredder bar is what forms uh, the vortices it's that obstruction uh, the shape varies by manufacturer some of them may also be removable, um, but you see that they are uh, broad on the front and tapered on the rear. Now we get into uh, some detectors, and there's quite a few different detectors here. You'll see uh, we have thermistor style detectors. Uh, we have a motion style uh, detector here, which moves back and forth. Uh, and it's detected by the piezoelectric sensor. Uh, we have a strain gauge version one here, which strain gauges uh, are a resistance type device, and they call this a cantilevered strut. And again, this is very similar to that flag. Uh, the original idea of flag fluttering back and forth, so as the pressure builds on one side, pushes this way, builds the other side, pushes that way. Uh, so that, that's so many different ways of detecting it. Last one here, but not least, uh, something called a diaphragm element. So this is just a pressure sensing diaphragm. Uh, there'll be one on each side. Uh, and again, due to the dynamics of these alternating vortices, uh, we're going to also have alternating pressure on, on each side in this diagram. The pressure will be high here. The pressure will be low here. So we can detect that differential. So as a vortex is shed from one side of the bluff body, the fluid velocity on that side increases uh, and the pressure on that side decreases on the opposite side. The velocity decreases and the pressure increases, thus causing a net pressure change across the bluff body. And of course, the entire effect is reversed as the next vortex is shed from the opposite side. 
Consequently, the velocity and pressure distribution adjacent to that bluff body changes at the same frequency as the vortex frequency or the vortice, vortice forming frequency. So all very related to that back and forth movement. So based on that previous explanation, we can look at all the different uh, possibilities of detecting these vortices. Uh, I believe I have a slide for each of these bullet points here. So we'll look at oscillating flow across the face of the bluff body, uh, pressure difference across the sides of the bluff body, flow over pressure at the rear of the shredder bar, uh, shutter bar, sorry, presence of vertices downstream of the shutter bar. We haven't looked at that one yet. Uh, and a flow through a passage drilled through the bluff body. We haven't really looked at that one yet. So uh, just quickly looking at uh, some of these in a little bit more detail as we move forward here. So measuring flow across the front, uh, the example here is we get thermistor uh, sensors. And as the flow oscillates, back and forth across this bluff body, the heat transfer is going to fluctuate between these two self-heated thermistors. It's going to be directly related to the vertices forming on each side and their ability to draw heat away from these thermistors in an alternating pattern. So interesting te technology to be able to use that by uh, heat transfer using thermistors. Using differential pressure across across the sides here, uh, you'll see um, piezoelectric sensor elements here. This maybe isn't the best diagram for this one. Um, this one's called the, the strain shutter bar, and a piezoelectric sensor in here detects the strain as the pressure changes as the vortices pass. Uh, just a little thing on piezoelectric sensors, just to give you a common something common to relate them to. A uh, barbecue igniter uh, is a piezoelectric device and the way the barbecue igniter works is there a little, there's a little crystal, uh, crystal in there, it's a piezoelectric crystal and if you apply force to this crystal it creates a voltage um, and that's how piezoelectricity works. Um, so when you hit your barbecue igniter, it's spring loaded, it creates a snap which uh, causes a weight to hit this crystal, the crystal hits the uh, the weight hits a crystal, creates some force. That force creates an electric charge, which is carried out as a spark uh, to light your barbecue. Uh, so in this case, it doesn't, of course, make the spark, but it does generate um, a little bit of electricity um, that is used to detect that something is happening there. Next one here, a different method of measuring uh, based on differential pressure, again, across, is the diaphragm element. Um, and they can use different electrical features, um, basically same capacitance, resistance, or voltage signal is produced as the pressure change is sensed at the diaphragm when the vortices pass. So the electronic or the signal portion of it is uh, not as important uh, to us as, as recognizing that this is really like a, a diaphragm style pressure uh, switch that generates some type of electrical uh, signal. So uh, trans pressure transducer nonetheless. Okay, this now we see we're moving to differential pressure across the side, uh, not the front. Oops, quickly missed that one here. This one's called a shuttle ball uh, and shuttle flow sensor. It's not in the ILM anymore. Uh, I do show it to you um, because I'm not 100% sure if uh, I have taken it out of all of my exams here. Um, but again, this is measuring from the side and basically rather than having a, a measuring instrument, um, off the front here. It's just got this shuttle ball um, and it's got a thermistor sensor in it or a magnetic pickup in it as you see here. A couple of different ways to do it and this ball will move back and forth uh, and the magnetic pickup can detect that. Just you know a little extra knowledge never hurts anybody. Okay looking at flow or pressure at the rear of the bluff body. So this is a strain gauge uh, cantilevered strut type sensor here. Uh, and again, this is like a flag floating in the wind here and the alternating differential pressure produces an alternating strain on the strut and the signal is from a strain gauge, which is a, a resistance device uh, and that signal will probably go to a weak stone bridge uh, and measure, uh, give us a measurement of what's going on as the vortices move back and forth here. 
Another one uh, measuring flow or pressure at the rear is a diaphragm element, uh, very similar construction to the one that we uh, saw earlier here. The diagram doesn't really um, represent the difference between the one across the, the front and the one at the rear, but uh, this example is a filled piezoelectric double face diaphragm capsule, very fancy, uh, which has a piezoelectric crystal in it. Uh, this one, the sensor can be removable. Um, but again, technology wise, uh, this one is specifically noted as being piezoelectric, whereas let's just zoom back here. Uh, this one here says it could be uh, capacitance resistance or voltage signal. So piezoelectric would just create a voltage signal. Um, so I don't really know if that distinction is particularly necessary. I think they're pretty much the same. Okay, uh, last one here. Is this the last one? Close to the last one anyway. Uh, flow or pressure at the rear of the left body again. Uh, we have a capacitance detector with a, a flag hanging down here, um, which I'm assuming is going to move. And as that flag uh, detects the changes in uh, dielectric, I guess, between the process medium and the flag, it'll cause an alternating strain. And that flag movement, movement simulates a switch and changes an electrical property. And in this case, that property uh, is capacitance. Okay, I think this is the last one here. As this one counts, the free board as he's downstream. So we have our bluff body here, and somewhere way past the rear of the bluff body, we have uh, a force detector. Uh, the vortices are detected by a separately mounted force detector, uh, a little bit more rugged, it says in the ILM, um, but somewhat less sensitive. Well, there is one more after this. Last one, I believe this is the last one finally, is the ultrasonic detector. Uh, we have a, rece a receiver and a uh, transmitter uh, transmitting ultrasonic sound wave uh, across the, um, the body of the device. And the vertices are detected by the modulation of an ultrasonic beam. Um, very, I mean, the science is similar to the ultrasonic level as far as the, the sonic part of it is. Um, but this is one of the ones that is uh, unique because I guess it, it's kind of on the outside of the pipe. Okay, pros and cons for vortex meters here. Uh, lots of advantages, uh, not too many limitations. So good for gases, steam, and generally clean liquids. Uh, wouldn't be able to get away with this at the wastewater treatment plant, for example, because there would be all kinds of uh, things hanging up on that bluff body. Uh, the output frequency is linear to flow rate, so that's pretty common for most devices we've covered. Uh, reliable because there are no moving or wearing components. Eh, maybe, maybe not. It did say that components could wear if there's dirt in them. Uh, designs are available that are, uh, can safely handle hazardous or toxic fluids. Measurement is independent of density, pressure, or temperature, uh, providing the Reynolds number is greater than about 20,000. Again, don't get too hung up on all the all these numbers here. Uh, just know that this is one of the fussier ones in terms of having uh, a, a Reynolds number assigned to it. Pressure loss is a function of the shredder bar, or like, I like saying shredder bar for some reason, the shredder bar size, uh, but is approximately 25 kPa's. Again, understanding that the greater the obstruction you have in your process piping, uh, the greater pressure loss you're going to have, and generally pressure loss is not something that we want. Limitations, uh, they can't make them too small, uh, half inch is what they say. Uh, the size is greater than about 16 inches uh, are too big, so there's kind of a range there in sizes. Um, low K factor creates a low resolution, lower than turbine meters, so maybe not a great device for custody transfer if you have a choice. Um, cannot measure low flows and or high viscosity fluids. Uh, again, you're looking at physics here. Uh, it's got to be thin enough uh, or going at a velocity fast enough that it can actually create vortices. So viscosity uh, could uh, play into that for sure. Um, and this is not a bi-directional flow device uh, due to the physical design 
uh, of that bluff body, um, non-bidirectional. Okay, here's uh, one of these uh, wonderful flow uh, type diagrams here in this chart uh, relates Reynolds number uh, and its effect. So we see our Reynolds numbers uh, growing, growing here and basically showing uh, that at low Reynolds numbers uh, we have a bad K factor and as we get into the higher Reynolds number, we get more consistency. Um, after about 50,000 uh, over here, we get audible cavitation. Uh, and again, cavitation is bad. It can quickly erode the inside uh, of uh, piping components. Low flow cutoff. Uh, downside to this meter is that the flow rate is too low. Obviously, the fluid is going to stick together by nature or by physics, and no vortices will form. They don't form, they can't be counted, and you end up getting a false zero as a result. Uh, the flow rate at which you stop getting vortices forming is the low flow rate or low flow cutoff. Low density gases um, have uh, issues here with vortex meters. They produce a weak pressure pulse, uh, especially if the pressure is low and the flow is low, so not a great choice for this application. Process buildups. Uh, building up on the shutter bar will adversely affect the K-factor and thus its accuracy. Uh, although it can handle some dirt, uh, it is not recommended. Okay, accuracy uh, affected by mixed phase flows and should be avoided. That's a really general statement. Uh, you know, if you've got a liquid flow with uh, entrained fluids, uh, sorry, a liquid flow with en entrained gases in it, well, those gases make up part of your volume and will provide uh, an erroneous reading. So that's irrelevant of the type of device we're using. Uh, this, this statement would apply. So gases should be gases, liquids should be liquids. If they're mixed, it's going to be uh, affecting your accuracy. Uh, more advantages and disadvantages. So we've already looked at this already. All kinds of silly numbers here in terms of Reynolds number. Again, don't let this overwhelm you too much. Go by what the self-test says uh, and you'll be fine. So good for liquids, gas, steam, and reasonably clean flows, no moving, part, no moving parts, reasonably accuracy uh, uh, for liquids, about 0.5, gas is about one. You'll notice that as we go through uh, all devices here, you'll see accuracy a little bit more uh, a little more accuracy for liquids than there is for gases, and again, largely due to uh, temperature and pressure effects on gases. Uh, disadvantages, all related to flow rates and making sure that you have proper flow. Okay, again, won't work with high viscosities or low velocities. Installation requirements. Uh, like all the meters that we've used, make sure, su make sure that it is suitable uh, for the process in terms of temperature, pressures, and chemi chemical compositions. Uh, avoid excess uh, vibrations. Again, some of these uh, sensing uh, elements can be affected by vibration, verbal diarrhea here today. Uh, size is usually smaller than the adjacent piping, similar to turbine meters. This allows full operations at lower flows. Uh, proper upstream requirements are subject to the types of disturbance, the design of the meter, and the level of accuracy needed. And as a general rule, five, excuse me, 15 to 50 upstream and five downstream. So this is almost exactly the same uh, as turbine meters were previous. And you'll see so far, everything has been five downstream. What makes these numbers change? Just to give you some perspective here, a reduction, uh, reduction here changes the piping dynamics, 15 diameters downstream. An elbow here creates a bunch of turbulence, so we need 20 diameters downstream. Uh, opposing directional elbows here creates a lot more turb turbulence, so in order to get straightened out, it needs more pipe. Um, two elbows going different planes and different directions, uh, much more turbulence, again, much more pipe, and uh, final control element in there. Uh, lots of pressure drops, lots of turbulence, all kinds of stuff going on there. So 
way higher requirements for that. Um, and I'm not so much concerned uh, at the end of the day with you being able to say, well, if I have one elbow, uh, what's my pipe diameters? Or if I have two elbows in the same plane or different planes, what's the number? I'm not so much concerned about the number uh, as much as I am uh, you understanding it is the effect of the piping and the turbulence it creates that determines how many diameters you need to get that proper developed flow before the measuring device. Okay, installation. Uh, looking at those upstream requirements, uh, we can reduce them by using flow conditioners or straightening vanes. So here's a one version of it. There's lots of different kinds. This one's a plate. There's tube styles. Uh, there's longer ones, shorter ones. Uh, all kinds of different configurations of them. I can show you some uh, next week when we're in the lab. So putting something like this in there will knock your pipe diameters down uh, considerably. Okay, installation physically uh, mounting the device can be mounted vertically or horizontally, again, providing that we're going for full pipe just like any of the other devices. Uh, any other devices also will uh, fall under this point as well. Uh, avoid gaskets protruding into the flow stream. Uh, of course, we don't want to uh, impinge on the flow stream and create more uh, pressure drop than is necessary. Uh, so again, perfect situation uh, A, right? This is the one that they always prefer. Uh, second choice B with some vertical piping immediately afterwards, uh, meaning that this, if this pipe is full, obviously this is full. Uh, what's up with C and D? These are weird, right? So I was happy to see this added to the ILM. Uh, because these are commonly used on steam, they have a tendency of getting very, very hot. Uh, hot and electronics don't go together very well. Uh, so C and D uh, show different mounting styles that are uh, intended to uh, deal with the amount of heat that's generated with the, with the normal application for a vortex meter. Uh, and by flipping, flipping the transmitter under the piping, any, any heat is going to rise uh, away from the transmitter. This one's sideways mounted. It doesn't really represent it very well, um, but sideways mounted. So same idea, any heat from the piping system is going to uh, float up and not affect the, the transmitter there. So that's kind of cool. Okay, maintenance and calibration. Not a lot here, um, no moving parts, so a little maintenance, basically it's cleaning uh, and anywhere that does occur is going to have to be significant to make a difference. Uh, calibration is done against a master meter and a correction factor or meter factor uh, is applied and or it is verified electronically by the transmitter uh, against past results. Uh, we've seen a couple devices that do that uh, already. Okay, here's the fun part where I get to show you a video. So let's see how this works out for me. substances are transported and distributed in piping systems every single day. They can include solvents and chemicals, oil and gas, coolants in primary industry, or steam for energy transmission. The fluids flowing through pipes often have completely different properties. Consequently, different principles for their measurement are required. One method is flow measurement based on the vortex principle. In 16th century Italy, Leonardo da Vinci observed how vortices form in flowing water. Some 400 years later, Hungarian physicist Theodor von Karman described the physical laws that govern how these vortices take shape. Here's how this measurement method works. Inside each vortex flow meter, a bluff body is located in the middle of the pipe. This body is a kind of obstruction that disturbs the flow. 
downstream from the bluff body is a mechanical sensor which can register the tiniest pressure differences in the flowing fluid. If the fluid is not flowing, no vortices form. As soon as the fluid starts to move and reaches a certain flow rate, vortices gradually appear downstream of the bluff body. These vortices are detached alternately on either side of the bluff body and are carried away by the flowing fluid. Zones of high or low pressure now appear downstream and thus create a phenomenon that is known as the carbon vortex streak. These differences in pressure exactly match the frequency of the passing vortices and are precisely registered by the mechanical sensor shown here in slow motion. This sensor is unique because it's inherently so well balanced that pipe-borne vibrations of up to 1G, pressure surges, and temperature shocks have no effect whatsoever on the measurement. The distance between two consecutive vortices corresponds to a defined volume of fluid, therefore total flow can be calculated by counting the vortices that pass. The higher the flow velocity, the higher the measured frequency of vortices. In some applications, the velocity is too low for perceptible vortices to form. However, the velocity can be increased simply by installing a vortex meter that has a reduced cross-section. This modification does not affect the measuring accuracy. Functionality can be enhanced by incorporating optional temperature measurement into the sensor. A configuration like this, together with a built-in flow computer, can calculate temperature-dependent mass or energy flow. This feature is particularly important in industrial processes involving saturated steam or gases. In today's marketplace, vortex flow meters from Endress and Hauser are the world's most robust and reliable with a lifelong calibration factor. They have won several prestigious awards and widespread acclaim for all applications. I am not sponsored by Andres and Hauser, just so you know. All right, folks, that is the end of the presentation for Vertex flow meters.